Hello and welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Satello Esquire, Mike Leno, and Evan Ginsberg. Evan, would you like to introduce our guest for tonight? Absolutely. He is a wrestler, a promoter, award-winning producer, legendary YouTuber from the HannibalTV.com, the number one combat sports YouTube channel in Canada, but known throughout the world. He is my friend Hannibal. How are you tonight? I'm doing excellent. And yes, it is the number one combat sports YouTube channel in Canada by far, the Hannibal TV. Very proud of that. There you go. So my first question is pretty obvious. With so much wrestling content out there and a lot of people covering, you know, the same Raw and SmackDown, how did you build this to such a... uh, Incredible success, Hannibal TV, 323,000 subscribers and millions and millions of viewers. What was the process to get it this big? It's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, it has over 200 million total views now. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, Evan, it's you and Mike Lano's appearance that. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Not the honky tonk man, us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Honky Tonk Man, his shoot interview with me has almost 4 million views, which might be the most viewed shoot interview on the internet. But I think what helped get it off the ground was I ran a company called Great North Wrestling for years. And when I started the channel off, it was just to post match footage of Great North Wrestling. So we had a base. And then somebody made a documentary on me about 10 years or so ago called This is Hannibal. And he had a bunch of B-roll footage because he had been following me uh, for two or three years making that documentary. And in that documentary, he had me interview a bunch of wrestlers since he wasn't a wrestling expert. But some of those interviews weren't used, so I ended up putting some of that B-roll interview on the Hannibal TV, and it turned out that the interviews were getting far more attention than the match footage. So then whenever we would do uh, matches in the future or wrestling events for Great North Wrestling, I would try and always interview the star, and it just built from there. Although some of the highest hit videos on my channel are match videos but overall the interviews do better than the matches and and controversy sells a guy like the honky tonk man who i'm a fan of you know he speaks his mind and i I think that 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 helps you know kayfabing or you know being too politically correct i don't think that helps a shoot interview a guy like honky tonk man he'll just you know say what he has to say, and I think that draws people. My first match uh, managing was uh, with the Honky Tonk Man on the card, so I had a chance to to meet him back backstage and listen to him weave a lot of stories. He's definitely a guy that has no shortage of, of wrestling stories. And then well, tell yes, the promotion that, uh, that I don't mean to interrupt. That Hannibal was uh, like covering initially. Who promotes that and who are some of the stars? I'm not familiar with that territory. It's my own territory, uh, Great North Wrestling. It's around the area of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. We do the three-hour radius. Uh, I started it in 2007, and we're this is our 15th year anniversary this year. COVID slowed us down a bit, but we have an event coming up. September 3rd in Petawawa, Ontario, but it's been pretty successful over the years. Some of our crowds have been over 3,000. Wow. Those are only a handful, and those cost a lot uh, to produce, but on average, we get about 400 in events, and I put on about five or six events a year. Can you uh, tell us about some of the bigger stars that have worked? Psycho Sid, we've used Terry Funk. Abdullah the Butcher, of course, uh, the Honky Tonk Man, Brutus Beefcake, Lanny Poffo, Greg Valentine, AJ Styles, oh, wow. Samoa Joe. Um, Another guy for it. Right? Yeah, the, the list goes on. Bushwhacker Luke. Uh, many, many stars have come through over the years. Demolition. 
um, Coco Beware. So yeah, we we usually use the combination of a always have a legend like a honky tonk man, and then we would have a Samoa Joe type or an AJ Styles type to draw the smart marks, and then a girls match, and then the locals. It's how we would usually draw people in. We use Kamala too. Uh, many of the greats over the years. So. And out of all of your accomplishments and all of your content, what would you say you're proudest of? Well, I got an interview with uh, a former Canadian Minister of Defense, Paul Hellyer, before he passed away. And I do do UFO related interviews as well. And that was a UFO related one. But he was the highest ranking government official I've ever interviewed. And he was the highest ranking government official to first go on the record and say that ufos are are as real as airplanes in the sky so now more the governments are becoming more and more open about it but i worked on that interview for two years wow and it took a lot of convincing to get him to do it so when i finally got it done it meant a lot to me but for as far as wrestling i think i've just i know you guys all know superstar billy graham Oh yeah, uh, interviews with him and becoming friends with him over the years. I think that's been one of the best parts of getting into this line of work. His birthday was just this week. That's true, and he's he's doing very well. I'm sure the new liver had something to do with it, but for a guy that uh, definitely took a lot of steroids, admittedly, in his career. He's he's do he's almost as old as uh, Bruno was when he passed away. However, superstar is in in heart failure, wow. so it's not like he's in great health. He has diabetes. He lost a toe about a year or two ago due to that. He's got skin cancer, and, and he is in the heart failure stage. But he's back under a WWE Legends contract, and is back on good terms with them. So I'm happy to see that well, speaking of that um superstar is one of my heroes I, I was there for his entire wwf title run back in 77 and uh going into early 78 and he was as dynamic charismatic as anybody i've ever seen as great a promo guy as anyone i've ever seen um what's your take on wwe you know taking care or not taking care of their legends like him. There's no health insurance, no pension, no 401k. I, I mean, he generated a lot of money for them over the years. I wish they would have done something like they did with Dusty with him, where they would have put him with the NXT wrestlers because he still has a very sharp mind and he's helped my company with promos come up with uh, promos and he's even written promos for me so he has a lot to offer so it's just too bad that they've kind of just let him waste away the past i guess they used him a little bit after he was inducted in the hall of fame i forget what year that was no but then you remember too i mean we all love billy and uh, bill anderson and i have you know trans him to different places and stuff he came out to my uh, L.A. Territory um, reunion in 2012, which, you know, Billy drove him all the way out from Phoenix, Arizona. But Billy had, you know, spoken against uh, WWE, not quite to the point of Abby, where Abby sold his Hall of Fame ring on eBay or something like that. But you know, that kind of... Uh, Billy also with... sold it, but he did sell it for legitimate medical reasons. Yeah, but I mean, he spoke out. You know, he was unhappy with some, he had some legitimate concerns and spoke out and kind of upset Vince at the time. So it's good. I'm happy that they're doing that. I, I don't want to interrupt because I know we're moving from topic to topic, but he started the superstar Billy Graham character in my home base, Los Angeles territory. And I want to ask you guys if any of the three of you know what he was called prior to that. When he, so he came in. Because Jerry Graham discovered him, some it's a long story in Arizona where Billy legitimately lived, had nothing to do with wrestling. 
Jerry brought him to L.A. with him, the team. Billy at the time still had jet black hair and a lot of it. And uh, Jerry dyed his hair black to match. And they teamed in L.A. in 1970. And then he sent him up to Stu Hart. But in, 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 uh, uh, Stu sent him down to Roy Shire in San Francisco before he came to, back to L.A. in 72. What was the name or nickname that Billy was going by before he became superstar Billy Graham in Roy Shire's Northern California Territory? Can any of you guys tell me in 10 seconds? I know he used his real name in Stampede Wrestling, so other than that, I have no idea. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you in 10 hours. All right. <laughs> the spirit of America, because he came wow. out with uh, brown leather, like chaps, like almost a cowboy outfit and a fringed leather jacket. And, uh, and then when he came into L.A., then he started doing the tie-dye stuff. And it was a, a big hit. He had a whole feud, out, you might remember, with John Tolis in 72. And he was teaming with some of the greats there that he was meeting for the first time, Ernie Ladd and Killer Kowalski, in like six mans and tags. And then he went and brought the, the colors to the AWA in Houston and then finally went to Tri-WF. But Billy was one of the most colorful guys ever. And the promo stuff, you know, everybody knows so he uh, has credited Muhammad Ali and various others and, and actual preachers for the stuff that he was doing. And so the, the fact that he had a, a long time association with the church in his native Phoenix, where he was reborn and all that stuff was, was pretty cool. So yeah, and I noticed, uh, Evan, you said in my interview with you that he signed autographs for you as a heel. And one thing people don't know about Billy and lots of wrestlers have told me over the years he didn't have an ego even when he was world champion. He would treat the jobbers just like uh, the main event guys, and he would ride with the jobbers and stuff. So sometimes he's misunderstood because he is temperamental. But overall, I could say he's one of the nicest wrestlers I ever met. There you go. Oh, yeah. And I, 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 have one, I have one question for all you guys since we're talking about Billy Graham. Um, Mike, Mike and I go back forever. Um, as far as charisma, where would you rank him? Got to be top five ever, wouldn't you say, Mike? Yeah, because he told he's told me that story, you know, many times of how like he had so much charisma and, and skill on the mic that he was unsure about being paired with Ernie Roth, the Grand Wizard, you know, when he came in that first time because he really never needed anybody to talk for him and he could out talk Jerry Graham. Um, uh, uh, niceness factor, yeah, definitely, because I was lucky enough to shoot him his match. Uh, he had uh, several matches with Harley Race, unification ones, but he had one in St. Louis and Kansas City. And when he came into the Chase Hotel in St. Louis, this was 70, because uh, he still had the strap, and he had an odd heel-heel match that he said was one of the most fun in his career with uh, Jimmy Valiant at St. Louis at the Keel. They're both doing heels, but playing heel, but they're both getting cheered. And um, Billy said, this is the charisma thing again, that he was lobbying. He knew that he was only a transition champion for, you know, between Bruno and Backlund, but and he knew his time was going to be limited to, and, and even though it was the most Vince had ever tried with a heel, you know, he didn't even try Buddy Rogers that long, his first champ. So it was like whatever his reign was, six, eight months. And he started to lobby and beg. He said, you know, the people are cheering for me. I've got this charisma to Vince Senior to turn him face, to keep him as a face champion and maybe not go right to Backlund. And he thought he could do amazing business. And he was like one of the first guys after Destroyer to market. And, and he was telling Vince Senior, you know, the people love me, all this charisma and blah, 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 even though I'm a heel, we could make a mint selling T-shirts with me on there. And because... Tri-WF had no T-shirts or no gimmicks, really, of any wrestlers then. And Vince Sr. just didn't listen to either one of them. And, and Billy lamented that. And it was a, a great source of uh, depression for him because he was over like a million bucks. If you know, at, at the Garden, it, it, the audiences just – and they loved him. And he, and he connected with them unlike any other heel up to that point in that territory. And even though he's a heel, I mean – he was getting Bruno type reaction. Well, if Superstar wanted a birthday present, he just got one from us. 
Uh, 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 I I saw and I shot him in a ton of places. I shot him as a babyface teaming with Dusty Rhodes in the AWA against Horst Hoffman and uh, uh, Jeff Ports, I think it was. Uh, Yeah, Hannibal, I'd like to find out a little bit more about, like, your history in the ring. Uh, Did did you wrestle yourself? Were you also... Yeah, he trained me when he was on our show. We talked about the hearts breaking him in. Okay, and and so tell me how you got started as a wrestler, and and how you built that up to becoming a promoter. Uh, well, I was uh, the equivalent of a state champion two times in high school. Then I was a junior national champion in freestyle wrestling. Then I had a bunch of scholarship offers, but. Eric Bischoff was starting a company called Matt Rats with many of the Hart grandchildren, such as Ted Hart, uh, Natty Neidhart, TJ Wilson, and Harry Smith were involved, among others. And I had sent in my amateur wrestling tapes because they were looking for teenagers to be part of this show. And they accepted me, and I was involved in a pilot, and I basically caught the wrestling bug from doing that. Even though nothing came out of the show, I ended up training with uh, the Hart family and as well as Jacques Rougeau in Montreal and just going into pro wrestling. What happened to Matt Ratz? I don't remember they had episodes in the can, or what happened to that? Did it ever air? The the guy funding it, Graham Owens, ended up getting arrested. He was a pilot smuggling drugs, I guess, across the border. So Alleg- allegedly, yeah. he, I believe he went to jail for it. Oh, okay. He went to actually, he actually went to prison for it. So, like, the funding kind of disappeared because Mauro Ranello was involved too as the commentator. Really, Don Callis, yeah. Some good people there. And it was just literally the same year WCW closed, and Eric Bischoff had given us a few speeches that everyone was telling him the WCW guys were old, so he's going to go the opposite direction and try it with younger kids. But, of course, nothing came out of it. And, yeah, all it did was kind of give me the bug for wrestling. Jack Evans was part of that, too. Dynamite right. Jack Evans is one of the greatest uh, underappreciated talents out there. And I think now he's doing a one shot for Impact. Uh, who should sign him, you know, since Tony Khan released him from AEW. What is the story on TJ? Because I don't know his background. He's obviously married to Natty and yeah. trained with Stu or maybe Bruce and Ross. But what's TJ's story briefly? Who is he? Is he related? Uh, I mean, is he... Related or not related to anybody in the business other than now being married to Natty? He was the same age as Ted and Ted's brother who passed away. I think his name was Matt from a flesh-eating disease. Oh, right, right. right. And yes. Yeah, so they went to school together. And so TJ was always over at the house training and was kind of part of the family and was dating Natalia for for many many years ever since they were teenagers so he was just kind of considered an adopted member of the family in in several ways i guess it's so interesting like every single person i I don't even i don't think smith who passed away and was a great guy was married to a wrestler but it's like not i would yeah almost everybody you know has like a story from diana with bulldog etc etc so that's quite an interesting family and and obviously Natty's, uh, you know, father uh, marrying one of Stu's daughters, too. Yeah. And a lot of the granddaughters ended up going out with wrestlers as well. One of the great Smith's uh, daughter just passed away. Her name was Satania, and she was young, only in her 30s. I don't know what she passed away from, but uh, she was also part of Matt Rats. But she unfortunately died a few months ago. Was she the one that was, uh, like, hoping for a wrestling career that didn't happen about, uh, like, in 2015 that had wild-colored hair? Was that the... the... Uh, I think that would have been uh, Dynamite Kid's daughter. Okay. I think that might have been Bromwyn Billington, who who kind of gave up on wrestling but does managing still. 
Yeah. And, and Hannibal, I have a tough question for you. Out of thousands and thousands of hours of content, who haven't you interviewed, wrestling or otherwise, it doesn't have to be wrestling, who would be like your dream interviews that you haven't done yet? Well, I would say The Rock and Vince McMahon and Donald Trump would maybe be my top three. Okay. Maybe I'll get one of these. Why, guys. why uh, Donald uh, Trump, who... Uh, He's colorful. Well, like him or not, the guy's colorful. He's a WWE Hall of Famer and has been involved in combat sports for many years. So I would like to like get into that side of his business thoughts there's a, there, there's a rumor there's a rumor that trump didn't know it was a work is that true or not <laughs> i doubt that but <laughs> okay maybe it's just the internet rumor okay. yeah trump co-owned the very short-lived affliction promotion with oscar de la hoya which was a major mma the first show they had i shot at the la coliseum uh, brock lesnar was in the main event against the uh, i can't think of the guy now the russian uh, or Orlovsky, who would wear the Dracula fangs out to the yeah. ring, you know, uh, very colorful guy, too. We we're talking about Billy Graham. But, uh, you know, Trump was there and he does like MMA. Obviously, he's been to he's been cheered and booed at UFCs when he's attended them. Hannibal, so I've been a voter, too. Yeah, Hannibal, I've been a big fan of combat sports myself going back a long way. In fact, I saw the original UFC one pay-per-view the one that had the uh, uh all the different you know the sumo wrestler and 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 uh one of them um, was a great friend of evans uh, manny yarbrough who passed manny away Yarbrough, yeah he was he did the wrestle with us yeah yes and so uh do you how far back do you go with watching those sort of ufc and other combat sports uh, I only kind of got interested in it when I started, uh, like training in combat sports, um, more seriously as I was already a pro wrestler, I started doing like, uh, MMA training and boxing training on the side. I was actually going to have an MMA fight, but it was around the same time that I had that thing happen where I wasn't able to get medically cleared for WWE. And that affected me ever being able to fight MMA. But I did end up having three kickboxing matches. But but yeah, now I'm more I I follow uh, combat sports more than I used to. I started off as just a pure wrestling fan, but now I think the promos are almost better in MMA most of the time than wrestling. I find wrestling when they do press conferences, they're more boring, even though it's fake. And it seems like MMA has like the wrestling style press conferences, even though it's real. Yeah, that's what I was going to sort of go to, is that do you feel that MMA is sort of stolen pro wrestling's thunder? You know, back when 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 Mike and, and, and when Evan were younger and even myself, you know, there really wasn't MMA to choose from. You really either watch boxing. Sometimes you'd get to see, you know, karate in the Olympics and, uh, and judo in the Olympics. And that would be just about it as far as like uh, fighting sports. You know, you didn't, kickboxing wasn't on TV. They didn't have MMA. But when MMA came around, you know, do you feel it's sort of stealing the thunder of, of a lot of things that wrestling was, was popular for? I think just WWE going corporate um, and wrestling going corporate is kind of just made wrestling more interesting. It used to be less in interesting because it used to be like an escape and there used to be larger than life characters and there was mystique and now there's not that much mystique and it's it's very corporate and it's just not the same escape that it once was i don't i know that a lot of wrestling fans like mma but i think those fans as evan said in my interview i think they're still out there there's still wrestling fans that exist i think one of the reasons my channel is popular is because i represent like, I am still a wrestling fan. I'll watch 80s wrestling, 70s wrestling all the time. I'm interested in the shoot interviews and the stories. But I, other than the news and what's going on behind the scenes, I don't find today's product entertaining. And I think uh, that's part of the appeal of my channel. 
uh, because a lot of the channels, the the hosts are still wrestling fans. Where I'm, I wish I was still a wrestling fan, but I'm not. I can't. I can barely sit through the five minute highlights. Wow. Yeah. I haven't watched Ferrara SmackDown since 2017. It's painful. It's stultifying. Yeah. But are are you watching uh, Impact, which has a Canadian ownership, or uh, A? Uh, AEW, which you know on Wednesday Fridays has the best show on wrestling easily, and even NWA, Billy Corgan's doing great things. Well, I was happy to hear Harry Smith uh, became tag team champions in M- NWA over the weekend. Uh, Impact, we don't, I don't think we even get it in Canada, or they run, I don't think they even run events in Canada, even though it's owned by a Canadian company. Yeah, they were doing papers. You could watch it free on uh, on YouTube if you don't get the access network that they partially or fully own. And and Thursdays is kind of a big deal because it's almost all they they show like a, a, a fifty dollar TNA old classic pay per view. Then they have some kind of a best of TNA stuff. Then the Impact show itself, and then the New Japan, and then there's before the Impact. So it's like a half day or more, ten to twelve hours of wrestling programming on Thursdays only. And then the rest of the week, it's all rock music. Well, I wish them luck. Uh, there's just, there's no one that really grabs my attention. I watch more kind of the girls wrestling. For some reason, I I find girls wrestling slightly more entertaining than guys. Or Brock Lesnar, I like. I find him entertaining. Or if the, the John Cena comes back, I'll obviously watch what he does at the end of the month. But uh, other than that, there's just no one that really uh, captures me and makes me really want to watch for some reason. Speaking of women, just briefly, is is there still the all women's group in Montreal that was making waves a few years back? It was a big deal. Yeah, they. I ha- I don't think they've run since COVID. They they were getting popular a few years ago, but uh, no. There is, there is a new one out of Vegas that I recently aired their footage on my channel called The Ultimate Women of Wrestling that put together a pretty good roster, and they're going to have their second show in July. Um, and I know there's women of wrestling, but they seem to be having behind-the-scenes problems these days. I've they did a of- taping. Uh, that's the thing that Jeannie Buss, who's the GM of the L.A. Lakers, is yeah. figurehead president of, and she's partnering with Dave McLean on that. But yeah, there's been like no buzz. They were supposed to be on X amount of CBS Viacom stations in the U.S. I'm not sure about Carriage in Canada, but yeah, there's like no buzz, no nothing. And they have Shaw Guerrero, Eddie's daughter, as ring announcer. They have uh, AJ Lee, CM Punk's wife, is like the I don't know. She's going to be the on-air lead, behind-the-scenes person supposedly running stuff and quite a bit of talent and then uh tessa blanchard is lead star again as they did uh, before that you know that's where that uh, uh lioness uh, i forget what her name is in wwe nikita lion that's where she came from she was the top baby face and i guess the last wow women of wrestling champion from mclean and uh, so now she's in nxt and injured but um, she's going to be one of their top stars very soon and that's somebody that mclean kind of discovered I do remember when they first announced that promotion, there was a lot of buzz for a couple of weeks. And then now the the last I've heard about it was there was issues with Tessa Blanchard at the taping and she might be done with the company now for whatever reason. Oh, what a shame. But she had such a promising career and to see it kind of fizzle is kind of depressing. Um, it was very impressive. Remember, she was taking on guys like Sammy Callahan and Impact and beat him for the men's championship, which was a big deal. And then it all kind of went down the toilet. Yeah, and I did buy a lot of Tessa Blanchard's matches from PCW Ultra for my channel, and they all do very well. Yeah. But I do understand she has attitude issues. I mean, we booked her uh, for a Great North Wrestling event a few years ago here in Canada, and there was some connection issue where she couldn't make the make the show. And then I ran into her at a uh, convention a few months later. And I said, do you mind just doing a quick interview with me? 
apologizing to the fans for the connection issue and saying you'll be back. And she told me no. (laughs) So it's like, I can understand how she has attitude issues because like that's, that's just something like as a promoter, it like gives you at least credibility because you always lose some credibility when there's a no show like that. But, uh, but she does draw and I would use her again based on the hits she has on my channel. (laughs) Uh, from those PCW Ultra matches that I have on my channel. I, I wanted to say that, you know, I'm amazed. First of all, it's amazing to go from wrestler to promoter. And I will say I, 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 I was the head promoter for one show down in California Championship Wrestling. For one show, because the promoter didn't show and I was next in line, I've never had a more difficult afternoon slash evening in my entire <laughs> life. I don't know how you've done it consistently over so many years. Can you talk about how you've made that a success and keep yourself from going completely insane as a promoter? Well, now it's a little less stressful because I make money of, off of match video footage. So I'm a little less uh, worried about event costs because I have other ways of making revenue off of it. But it, it is stressful. I mean... Our biggest show we ever had, we had 4,000 uh, fans at the Ottawa Civic Center. And Crush died a few days before. So mm-hmm. Bret Hart, who was the main draw, changed his flight to attend Crush's funeral. Wow. And wow. didn't make the show because he had to change his flight and his second flight didn't come in. So you you get so much heat and all the heat goes on you as a promoter in, in those situations Sadly, then you have some that I won't even name their names, but they'll they'll ask for all their money up front or they won't show up and then then they won't show up. And that's happened to me a a few times, but it's very stressful. But if you're kind of an adrenaline junkie like I am, it's kind of fun, too. And I do enjoy it. And I I like being in control as well of of my own shows and presenting wrestling how I want to present it. So. Well, but that is unfair to get heat when a talent has nothing to do. It's not your fault as a promoter and a talent for whatever reason, legit or no, doesn't show. It's like you're taking heat for their F up. And the least Tessa could have done was cut some kind of promo, just explaining it. She didn't have to apologize. She could have just said, you know, here's what happened, blah, blah, blah. It would be nice if she would add to the tail end of that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, show up for you guys. So that's that's kind of messed up. On, on the other hand, this similar thing happened to Haku where his visa or his green card had expired for a show we booked him on. And they told him if he crossed into Canada, he might not be able to cross back. Wow. So he, he couldn't make that show. But he did do a promo with me that got about 100,000 hits at the Cauliflower Alley Club where he apologized. Not only did he apologize, but he did a little angle with me to have a match uh, once he got his stuff sorted out, which he did get his stuff sorted out. So he kind of did it the right way, uh, being an old school guy and understanding how it can hurt a promotion when like one of the main stars doesn't show up and it didn't take him much to do. And he got another job out of it. And it's like, I would have easily given Tessa other jobs out of that. But when they won't do little, uh, little apology videos or explanation videos, uh, it makes you wonder if you want to trust them to, to book them again. But I do, it wasn't her fault. It was a connection issue, but it, it would have been nice if she had just said something. Right. Uh, Hannibal, where would you like to take all of this? You have a promotion that's successful. Obviously, the uh, the YouTube channel, I mean, is unbelievably successful. I mean, you know, you could coast with this forever, or where would you like to take it to, um, you know, even greater heights? What What's the game plan down the road? Uh, well, I, I am funding my own movie based on my wrestling character that's going into production later this month. Awesome. So I want to see how that goes. Maybe it'll be Does he a- need a manager? <laughs> it's all cast now, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do a movie basically for YouTube. Awesome. 
so I want to test uh, how that goes and see how we'd love to be able to promote it for you when you're ready when you have it ready sounds good and and yeah of course covid has uh it affected canada more than the u.s and it still actually affects us promoting here because you have to be vaccinated to get into canada so a lot of the talent aren't vaccinated still and don't want to deal with the paperwork of of coming here during, with all these COVID restrictions still. But as, as it goes away, I definitely want to go back into promoting more and more events and, and getting more angles that flow because uh, we had a night, my nightmare. Like, for instance, I'll tell you how COVID affected us last summer. I, I booked at Arita. And they had told us we were going to be allowed 50% capacity in the arena, which could hold a thousand people. And I bought the, uh, I paid for the advertising already. And I had printed the tickets, printed the posters, bought radio ads, and the radio ads were $1,500. Mm-hmm. And then they said, you can have 50 fans on the floor, 50 in the stands. <laughs> Wow. So at that point, it's like I can't even make money. Hey, in Northern California, that's considered a pretty good draw. Yeah. 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 So we ended up like adding a second show in the afternoon to at least have it double. But it's it's just been a pain in the butt uh, dealing with some of these COVID rules. And that was a that was the city going against the provincial rule, just making up their own rule uh, on the fifty in the stands, fifty. uh, in the on the floor, which easily could have been at least a hundred in e- in each, so it's unfortunate stuff like that that uh, hurts independent companies. But uh, hopefully, things will continue to clear up. And and out of the thousands of videos that you've done over the years, um, not not what's the highest views but what were the most meaningful to you for whatever reason like i remember you know i've done radio since 1991 and i remember interviewing sherry martell late night she said to me she was on the road 15 years and uh, she never saw a kid grow up you know and she was really pouring her heart out uh dr mike and i interviewed uh, eddie guerrero like two or three weeks after art bar died and he was sobbing Right, Mike. The guy was sobbing on air. Yeah, so, right. yeah. So some of these, some of these, you know, are meaningful to us. Um, so out of all the content that you have in your heart, like which, which are the most important and meaningful to you? The the ones where the wrestlers have passed away and they wouldn't necessarily have like another interview like that like i nikolai volkov i don't know if he has another full shoot interview on the internet or not but i did one with him a couple of years before he died so it's those ones that mean something to me because at least i've captured their career on video uh even though they passed away fans can go back and see it so it it's things like that 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 mean the most to me and the fans that come that say, hey, you helped get me through the pandemic, your content oh, kept great. me occupied and, and stuff like that. But mostly I just, I was a bouncer up until 2018. I still work a regular job with the city of Ottawa, but I don't have to have the part-time job getting attacked for a living anymore. So I'm just yeah. grateful uh, that, that I have this job now that I can do that I actually really enjoy. And I get to interact with uh, legends and people I grew up idolizing. So it's pretty cool. That, that sort of brings me to another point, Hannibal, which is, uh, it's fascinating to me because I've been to Canada. I drove up with my parents to Banff. Love Canada. If, if it wasn't so damn cold up there, I would not mind <laughs> living in Canada and giving up the United States for uh, everything. As much as I love baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie, I'd, I'd still, there's a lot about Canada to love. Now, we in, in America, we have this dichotomy that we think Canadians are all so polite and friendly and all that. Yet some of the fiercest, toughest wrestlers that have ever existed on this planet have come from Canada. 
Why do you, where is that, why is that dichotomy there? I actually find overall in the U.S., maybe I, I find that they treat athletes better. Like just the general public treats you with more respect than they do here. And I find people are friendlier overall in the U.S. We I don't, don't know talk to Draymond York. Green about Boston. Don't talk to Gray, Draymond yeah. Green about the Boston Celtics, though. Yeah. But no, I don't. I think that that's just kind of uh, we might be a little more docile and and non aggressive as far as wars and and combat, international combat. But um, there's gang issues here. There there's lots of criminal activity, just like in any big city. Yeah, talk to Dino Bravo about that. Yeah, I get that yeah. that side of things. But why is yeah. it that you're such fierce competitors in the ring? And you know, you have the legends like the Hart family and so forth. That that that. And Mad Dog Vachon, I think, was one of the fiercest. He's my favorite Canadian wrestler. I think I think uh, for the Hart family, it, it was just in their blood and. And I don't know, I guess it's just like any other wrestler from around the world, but maybe the Canadians stick out a little bit because there's less of them. I don't know. I think Koloff was out of Canada. Who's better than him? It's true. Yeah. He's what actually. Was that, uh, what was that nickname Maurice St. Paul gave him when he worked for Grand Prix, the Montreal promotion that was taken on in a great territory where the Rougeos, La Lute International, it was something pumpkin. It was either Koloff or. Uh, Jim Rashke, Baron Von Rashke, and, and the Vashon brothers gave him his first wrestling work name, and, and like the word pumpkin was in the middle. Baron Von Pumpkin, spoke. Baron Von Pumpkin, I believe. Oh, Bar that's it. That was yeah. uh, Wow. <laughs> wow. What a territory war that was. That was one of the greatest, just a tad below Bruiser versus Sheik in Detroit. Was the Vashon, it was like everybody in the world would come. The one sh outdoor show they had, I'm sorry to go offside a little bit, but it was so big in 73 that I shot. It was, it was actually 74. Jerry Park. Jerry Park, yeah. On top was Heel Heel, Killer Kowalski uh, dropping the title, the Grand Prix World title to Maurice Vachon, who then turned face afterward. But Heel Heel, terrific match. Bruno and Ed Carpentier beating the original Hollywood Blondes, uh, Jerry Brown, Buddy Roberts. Wow. Who, Later became a Freebird, managed by Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Abby was on the show. Sheik against Don Leo, Jonathan, you know, D double count out. Just wow. the, the Ladukes, Ed Athifier, Yvonne Robert Jr. The card was stacked up. And, and Blackjack Mulligan, you know, came up from, he was working in Bruiser's territory, came up to do the shot. It was amazing stuff. But the Bechant, boy, is there a lot of footage, to your knowledge, of Maurice in his prime? I'm not talking about. You know, when he and, and Von Raschke kind of in the 80s, AWA were not what they once were. But, I'm, you know, it's the stuff that WWE hasn't released. They've got that early 70s, late 60s AWA stuff they got from Greg Gagne. And it's like, come on, put that stuff out. You know, it shows Maurice and Paul against like Harley and and uh, 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 Larry Hennig, you know, some killer ass matches. It's just sad that that territory has died because Quebec could still be a territory, uh, but because WWE rarely comes there now and they only go to Montreal and very rarely Quebec City. But in their heyday, WWE used to do maybe 10 towns in Quebec. But as you said, when that territory was going, both of those companies were doing two to three shows a night. Big and the Rouge's promotion was on fire too. They had a ton of incredible wrestlers there. Abby was a regular there against uh, 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 got the the senior members, not Jock uh, Junior or uh, his brother. Uh, you know who most know from WWF stuff is the Rougeau brothers. But we're talking about you know the triad, the original paternal figures. That was Montreal was home of, of just a ton of great stuff at the Verdun Auditorium and. Uh, you know, this Jerry Park, they did a second outdoor show as well that drew like in, in excess of like 34,000 people. The first one drew more. And Jacques Rougeau, I covered this about, I don't know, four or five years ago now. He had his third retirement match at Jerry Park and had 11,000. And I think a lot of those fans just went because of the Neglastia of 
the other ones that were there in the past, but that was pretty good. 11,000 for the only star was Jock saying he was retiring again. You remember he would promote uh, like opposite when he was done with WWF, he would promote his own shows, maybe one or two a year. And they drew the biggest non major group. Yeah. It was incredible. The big, huge shows. He and uh, uh, Carl Wiley, who's now PCO, what, what are your thoughts on PCO like reinventing himself and just like killing his body doing I just he uh, his face broke open his arm uh, was busted the bone was popping through on impact last week he's done some incredible shit yeah and I've had a lot of matches with him and he was uh, helping train when I was training with Jacques and I was roommates with him in Puerto Rico and in England so I've known him a long time and I'm glad that he's getting another opportunity, even at his age, which he's in he's his 50s. He's now. in excess of 50. So doing amazing stuff. Because I know like back around the 2005 to 2008 years when he was still on the indies, I, w I honestly never thought he was going to make it again. But he was obsessed with trying to make it again. And I just saw him dedicating his whole life to, to independent wrestling as he was getting older and older. So I'm glad that he's getting these opportunities now. And I hear his impact contract runs out in the fall. So maybe AEW will pick him up or something because he's a very tough guy and a really nice guy and generous in the ring. Good for the young guys to be around because, uh, He'll, he'll help teach them how to work and so forth. But very tough. As you said, he's, it's amazing the punishment he takes. And I really hope that uh, it's not going to have severe long-term effects on him, all this punishment he's doing. But yeah, you're right. Uh, speaking of the Rougeau, and like, he was a great promoter, would regularly have three to 5,000 uh, person crowds in Quebec. But the the way he would do that is because Jog the Rougeau name is so famous in Quebec, he would go around to companies and sell sponsorships in exchange for tickets. And when he'd walk into these companies, they'd be all marking out that it's Jacques Rougeau. But it, it's incredible um, the crowds that he had, considering it was just him for the most part as the star. And sometimes his kids, Jacques had, I think, two sons that tried wrestling for a while but yeah, yeah it's Quebec it's and in particular Montreal were hotbeds for decades and decades and decades until you know WWF kind of did whatever they did and we're Kevin talking about back to the 30s and 40s all the way through the 80s yeah Hannibal I, I'd like to know since you're talking about successful promotions we always like I, when we get a promoter on here I always like to, to also find out in your opinion what are maybe the five things that you know of to get yourself to fail as a promotion? That's always an interesting angle. I'll just say one more thing about the Jacques Rougeau son. His son Cedric could have made it, but for some reason they didn't give him a chance out of the tryout. He was like 6'5". He looked like a superstar and he had the Rougeau name. And I've, I was friends with him. When this guy walks into a restaurant or bar, the girl, I've never been with anyone that the girls love so much, but they net for some reason, they didn't even give him a chance at a development contract after his tryout. And he could do like four fifties and stuff at his size. Wow. But it was always weird. Jock thought it was something personal that they were carrying against him. But I was, I find it weird that they'll sign some people with no experience at all and give them a chance, but a guy with the Rougeau name that looks like a movie star, they wouldn't give a chance for some reason. And then and then he got so disillusioned after that tryout that he quit wrestling and became a car salesman. So it's unfortunate the Rougeau name won't be carried on. But the five, the five biggest mistakes of a promoter, um, overbooking a card, is a big one i would say not getting insurance you should always have insurance um put put all put all your effort into it don't uh like look at it as a job and and like don't just half-ass it uh don't let wrestlers take advantage of you they'll all try and work you for every little every dollar here and there 
and treat try and treat everybody with respect and, and treat them well that way uh they'll want to work for you again and they'll spread the word that you're a good promoter to work for i guess that would be some of my advice but promoting is not a not a profitable industry i would not recommend it for people i yeah. mean you look at wrestle circus that was everyone was talking about a few years ago and they went out of business. There's very few uh, independent wrestling companies that actually make money because there's so much cost involved. So it's uh, it's unfortunate, and it's hard to get people out to shows. So you really got to put a lot of uh, money into advertising and a lot of effort into getting people out to shows. Oh, another thing is don't trust people to put out posters for you. Yeah. Always put out your own poster Street because feet, people yeah. don't do it. And like also with tickets, sometimes uh, this happened to me too many times that I I should have learned from my mistakes, but make sure uh, wrestlers, if they say they're going to sell tickets, get them to sign for them because they'll ask for like tickets to sell and then they'll say they lost them or something. Yeah. And in, the, in reality, they probably sold some to their friends and just pocketed the money. Wow. And Hannibal, please, uh, as we approach the end of the show, plug anything you want to plug. Well, we are on YouTube at the Hannibal TV. Uh, we I do wrestling news on there. We do shoot interviews, and we post match videos, not only of Great North Wrestling, but other wrestling companies that I have uh, collaborations with. And we're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at the Hannibal TV. And on our the Hannibal TV Facebook page, we actually have sixty six thousand followers now on there too. And some of our videos actually get more views on Facebook than YouTube now for whatever reason. So we encourage people to to follow on there. And my my Blood Hunter Thirst and Rage movie will hopefully be coming out in the fall. We're going to work on that. It starts production next week in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's uh, wow vampire slash wrestling movie and it's the same producers that uh made the mass mutilator with brick bronski who is another wrestler i'll just tell this story quickly because you're asking interviews that meant a lot to me yeah, yeah i was trying to get brick bronski who some of you guys might not know the most famous thing he's known for in wrestling is his fight with brian pillman in stampede wrestling but he actually had a fairly successful acting career in class of Newcomb High and a bunch of B movies. He was a pretty good actor. And I was trying to track him down for the longest time. And finally, his daughter commented on one of the videos of someone talking about him. And through his daughter, I got in touch with him. And I got this interview with him where I actually felt like we were connected and became friends. And it was only supposed to be an hour interview and it went over three hours. And three we literally, hours. Wow. yeah. And we literally had to stop because he was just too tired. And then <laughs> he just died a few weeks later. Oh no. And it like, oh. it was like, what is the coincidence that I've been trying to find this guy for years? I get the interview. Then he passes away. And it, it was just so sad to me because he really wanted to do a part two because we never even got into his movies. Mm. And when we ended that interview, there was just so much hope. And then to find out that he that he passed and he passed young, and I believe it was COVID related. So that that was uh, another guy that passed that I was that that interview meant a lot to me because nobody had interviewed him about his career. So now at least I have his career. On, on file for people to know about if they want the other side of the Brian Pillman uh, situation that he's best known for. And that's preserved forever. And anybody who, you know, family, friends, fans, you know, that's the beauty of it. It's art that's always there. So it's, it's great. And, and out of that interview, his producers uh, discovered me and, came up with this whole uh, movie idea for me. So hopefully that turns out into something uh, productive for me. So We need it to turn into a billion-dollar franchise. That's what we need. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure about that. but yeah. uh, You never know. You never know. 
Yeah. I'm trying to have all the actors much better ability than me. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Anyway. So um, how can people get a hold of you through social media and anything else? Just uh, there is some other people that run some of those accounts, but I, I am on Facebook at Devin Hannibal Nicholson and Great North Wrestling at gmail.com is our company email. But pretty much all platforms, the Hannibal TV, I'm not that hard of a person to get a hold of. So I appreciate you guys having me on. Always nice to... Uh, See you. Nice meeting you for the first time, but always nice to see Mike and Evan. Yeah. Great, yeah. great guys. Mike's a legend, and so are you, Evan. Oh, and your thank interview you. had great feedback. Yeah, oh, well, uh, when, when you're ready to promote your movie, you know, your uh, web movie, we'd really be like to have you back on again so you could talk about, you know, all of that and putting that together. We, we'd be very excited to, to be part of your promotional team. Just a question for Mike. Did you have any involvement at all in, in the Grunt, the wrestling movie? Because I think some of that was filmed in uh, the L.A. Yeah, it was filmed the L.A. Olympic. I was there for some of it. I wasn't on camera like I was as a photographer in Rocky Two, you know, ringside for a few seconds. But that was the one with Adrian Street, John Tolis, uh, geez, Ron, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, you know, there was quite a bit of talent. I think even Bill Anderson and Jesse uh, Anderson, uh, excuse me, Jesse Hernandez had little uh, unspoken, non-spoken roles. Yeah, that's that's a uh, uh, sort of like an obsessive thing for everybody, you know, to to try to find and, and watch that. A la the Sheiks, I like to hurt people, or you know, done yeah. about well a little bit earlier for the Vivian Vashon. How about that movie, Queen Queen of the Ring that's was. Funny. I love that. Man, I, love I, that. I, I still say she was the nicest, most talented, and at the time, I tell her to face the most beautiful woman in the biz. She really was, and her death heartbreaking. I, I think I told you, Hannibal, that when I pull out my shots of her to show Luna, who was just a very sweet person. I, Luna was really awesome for anybody who didn't know her behind the scenes. But she would just break down and cry looking at photos of her aunt. She really treasured, worshipped Vivian, uh, you know, and, and most of us held Vivian in such high respect. She went against the system with Mula, you know, even though Mula sort of had a, a, a hand in helping break her in. But she was one of those indies like Betty Nikolai or K-Star or uh, there were X amount of them that refused to be part of the Mula system that, you know, even back in the 70s, we heard whisperings that it was abusive. They didn't get their pay. They'd get locked in their hotel room. So Vivian was sort of that queen. And uh, she did appear quite a bit on the uh, the Grand Prix shows for her brothers who, you know, booked it. And I think Lu Xun, Greg War was the promoter of record. But it was really the Vichon's promotion. And uh, yeah, so back to the grunt thing. And I, I, I think... Uh, Baby Doll was the L.A. local wrestler we had. You know, she had a, a part in it. I can't think of what her real name is now. Um, but, yeah, it was like this thing offside that they did for money. Sort of like Rock Riddle doing a couple of bits on the Soupy Sales uh, revisited show in color in, starting in 1975 with a run till 77. And I think Grunt, what, what, Grunt, just off the top of my head, I think that was filmed in a couple of years later. Or so. Was it like 81 when it was oh, filmed? Good. And and Tolis said it was like his first role and he got a bigger payday than he ever did in wrestling. Wow. Oh, wow. Maybe, like, Maybe you want to stay with movies. Maybe your web movies is the way yeah. to go. Yeah. You want to, want to not have to work so But that's the stuff of, of legend. And uh, I'll have to dig up a, a couple of my photos that I took of, of some of the stuff that was going on in it. But it was the whole premise was kind of ridiculous. Some of the guys said they had to improvise their dialogue and stuff. Wow. All right, that folks. Well, YouTube for anyone that wants to watch it, and so is the Vivian Vachon one. Wow. Which is terrific. It really yeah. puts her over well. Well, we're right at the end of the show here, guys. So really appreciate you being on, uh, Hannibal. And uh, we're looking forward to having you a guest on, uh, hopefully again, pretty soon. Thanks a lot. Subscribe Thanks to the so much, Hannibal. Hannibal. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Great seeing you, brother. Good night, everyone. See you next week. Stick around, Russell. Okay. No, no, stay.